Today on Government Matters, robots in the air, underwater, and on the ground help carry out search and rescue missions. We speak with a research engineer at the National Institute of Standards and Technology to learn about those life-saving robots. And NIST is looking at creative ways to modernize manufacturing technology. We look at how getting 3D printing to its full potential could change the way we make things. Government Matters starts right now. From Washington, D.C. and around the world, this is Government Matters with Mimi Gerges. This is Government Matters, the only show covering the latest news, trends, and topics that matter to the business of government. I'm Mimi Gerges. When the Twin Towers fell on 9-11, robots were sent to comb through the rubble and find and sustain the people trapped below. But they failed miserably. Later, NIST's emergency response robotics team was funded to establish standard tests for ground, underwater, and aerial robots that are used for emergency response missions. Adam Jacoff is a robotics research engineer at the National Institute of Standards and Technology. He leads the emergency response robotics team. Adam, welcome to the program. Hi, Mimi. How are you? Good. What type of search and rescue operations have these robots actually been used for? Well, so uh, initially at the World Trade Center, you have to say that that was one of the worst collapses we ever seen. So it's not surprising that the robots would have uh, not done well. And that time frame, robots were more tactical military um, robots. So their designs were maybe not particularly tuned toward collapse structure search, um, certainly not subterranean search. Uh, so uh, since then, since our project was uh, set up, we've basically um, uh, sliced and diced the varying levels of difficulty for robots and developed standard test methods to measure their capabilities and to help remote operators understand their proficiency on those systems. So the World Trade Center might have been the worst case scenario, but there are uh, easier, uh, yet still hazardous applications for robots. Um, and you see that in bomb squads across the nation or even across the world, uh, working with improvised explosive devices. You know, you want to be at a remote standoff to be safe, but you need to be mobile and dexterous and uh, in communications at all times with the remote operator. So really anywhere that it wouldn't be desirable or it's too dangerous for a human being to go, a robot would be able to, to get to that um, in that situation. Ad explain how your work at the emergency robotics team fits into the larger mission of NIST. Well, so NIST is a federal research laboratory in the Commerce Department. So we're tasked with uh, inspiring innovation and uh, uh, developing standards, of course. So my project, and this is 3,000 engineers working in that direction, uh, all the way, including we're keepers of the time, for example, and doing research continually to improve humanity's understanding of time. And that's used everywhere, GPS and other places. Uh, so my project for emergency, emergency response robots is developing the measurement science specifically for those robots that have to go into unstructured environments, um, uh, keep people out of harm's way, perform those tasks reliably, and uh, ultimately our product is the standard test methods uh, that are used by all of these bomb squads and military organizations and urban search and rescue teams um, uh, to, uh, to provide that safe standoff distance. Explain that a little bit more, because as you said, you're responsible for establishing the standard test methods for the robots and for the operators. Yeah, so the standard test methods are used two different ways. If you think about it, it's one standard test method. It might be a terrain, for example, a complex terrain that a robot is supposed to traverse X number of meters through or do X number of laps. Um, that terrain evaluates the robot's mobility in the hands of an expert operator, usually provided by the manufacturer. But when in your hands or my hands, it evaluates our proficiency. So we can compare ourselves using that same robot and that same standard terrain or task against the expert operator and therefore understand our proficiency. And that's a comparable number that can be compared no matter where or when the testing occurs, whether it's here at NIST or in Japan. You co-founded the RoboCup Rescue Competition over 20 years ago. How did that come about? So um, 
so that competition uh, started as a DARPA program review or evaluation. So those robots that were deployed to the World Trade Center were part of a DARPA tactical mob mobile robot program. And the program manager was looking to have some objective measures of the research products, the outputs of that program, and wanted to do it in a way that reached out to uh, civilian um, robotics experts and brought them into the process of developing robots for whatever missions were necessary. So those early competitions, all focused on urban search and rescue, you know, started before September 11th. September 11th just kind of showed that we were on the right track, measuring them to be deficient. And, and then the competitions turned into a very vibrant development um, uh, process, both for the standard test methods, where we validate our latest prototype tests, and as a guide to help young engineers all the way from literally high school through PhD uh, to get involved in developing the next generation of robotic capabilities. And the competitions were put on hold the past two years because of COVID. Are they going to go forward this year? Actually, they were not put on hold. We have had literally um, 20 plus years of continuous annual competitions. But this year we did it in, remotely. Oh, I was going to say, so it was on put on hold in person, but you, you were able to do it remotely. So standards have certain advantages. One of the advantages is I could literally from my desktop monitor or proctor robot trials that were happening in Japan or in Germany. Um, I could do it in real time using a Zoom call such as this uh, with certain camera positions. The standard terrain, the standard dexterity task, those are replicatable. That's the whole point. The tests we develop are very, very inexpensive, very easy for others to replicate so they can test their own robots and their own operators. Uh, it's a very distributed model and the standards are what made our remote competition possible. Um, we also extend that into the virtual world. So standard test methods being so well-defined and abstract in a way, uh, they're very good for simulations. So developing simulated trials is also another way we can go with our uh, remote competitions. All right, Adam, we're gonna just pause right here and we'll be right back. Coming next, we continue our conversation with Adam Jakoff of NIST about robots being used for life-saving emergency response. Stay with us. Welcome back. I'm talking to Adam Jakoff. He is a robotics research engineer at NIST, where he leads the emergency response robotics team. Adam, tell me about the robot test facility that you have there at NIST. What, what do you do there? So this facility is really kind of the tip of the iceberg. It is a very visible prototyping facility where the standard tests and the measurement science are prototyped and worked through and developed. But then we are very quickly go out to the community through all the robot competitions we were talking about and to uh, test method validation exercises. Um, that's usually with emergency responders in their training facilities. Um, you know, we go to where the robots need to deploy, but we bring with us uh, these abstract, repeatable, reproducible test methods, the standard tests because that's where the statistically significant trials can be run and the confidence can be gained before deploying into those rather difficult scenarios. Uh, but then we also show people how to embed the standardized scoring methods into their training scenarios so that they have a quantitative measure of performance at the end of their training day. Our aerial tests are probably the best example actually. Well, before we go there, I want to ask you about uh, working with the Department of Homeland Security. Can you tell me how you're working with some of their components, such as FEMA and Customs and Border Patrol? Yeah, so DHS is one of our longest standing sponsors, so around 2005 or so. Um, the Science and Technology Directorate uh, stood up uh, a large portion of this uh, process, this uh, project, uh, along with the Standards Committee through ASTM International. So. There's a Homeland Security Applications Standards Committee through which all these test methods go and get validated. Um, 
And uh, DHS components have been using the tests uh, throughout um, to guide procurements. You're going to buy 10, 20, 30 million dollars worth of robots. You kind of want to have that objective level of testing up front to help guide your decision making. Uh, they help guide deployments. They help uh, uh, evaluate training. Um, so, for example, with our aerial test methods, as a matter of fact, so FEMA Urban Search and Rescue, one of our longest standing customer bases, um, is DHS. Uh, their Air Force, when they deploy, is the Civil Air Patrol. Civil Air Patrol is a widely distributed network of 52 wings. Um, they're using our aerial test methods to make their credentialing process a little bit more structured, much more measurable across the distributed network. Uh, so that when they deploy to places unknown with people nearby who want to lean in and help, there's some notion of what that capability is as they come on site. Um, the Border Patrol uh, uses our aerial tests uh, now for innovation. Uh, they're basically trying to keep track of a very fast moving drone market. As the new capabilities emerge, which ones are applicable to their mission space? Again, guiding procurements, uh, but then also for their training. They have a widely distributed network of more than a thousand pilots. Uh, they basically train the way they train and then they want to know how it turned out. So they use our test methods to evaluate that training at the end of the process. The four-legged robot is a cutting-edge technology for emergency response. Tell me about how that was developed and what it's used for. Yeah, so there you've seen those on TV. I'm sure you've seen the bipedal, two-legged, humanoid-looking robots also. Uh, this is all just um, really full circle for me because what got me into robot competitions in the beginning, 1987, uh, junior in undergrad. A long time ago. I joined ago. a... <laughs> <laughs> walking robot decathlon. Yeah, you do the math. Uh, that walking robot decathlon was a six-legged beast. It was a machine. It wasn't very robotic at all, but it walked. It walked with water on its back, as a matter of fact, took second place. So come full circle, 15, 20 years later, I'm doing the DARPA Robotics Challenge, designing the test methods for that large worldwide humanoid uh, robot competition. Um, the humanoids coming very quickly, looking really promising. But then the four-legged robot dogs looking, you know, the dog size, look ready. They're ready for uh, deployment into these unstructured environments. Remember, unstructured environments are semi-collapsed houses, maybe just really messy houses, but need to be remotely searched uh, with all the humans outside. Um, so they never know what they're going to encounter. So they have to have a certain level of flexibility and a lot of autonomy. And what makes those legged systems work is the fact that they're almost completely autonomous, except for which way you might be going, a little bit of judgment, the walking, the balancing, the negotiating of obstacles, all done automatically. And that's the way it needs to be. So the subtext for my whole project from day one, I'm in the intelligence systems division. And I knew from the beginning that it's the intelligence of the systems that makes them useful. It makes the remote operator look good as an operator, but it's because the onboard intelligence is allowing all the quick decision making that needs to happen. And the drones are the best example of that. The fact that they almost fly themselves. And if they're not doing what they are supposed to do, it's probably because you're giving it bad inputs from your remote position. All right. Well, Adam, we'll have to stop at, at that point. But thanks for sharing your work with us. I appreciate you being on the program. Coming next, NIST is looking at creative ways to modernize manufacturing technology. Straight ahead on Government Matters, how getting 3D printing to its full potential could change the way we make things. We'll be right back. Regenerative medicine uses 3D printed materials to create and restore tissues and organs. But these 3D printed materials can have microscopic manufacturing flaws that jeopardize the safety and reliability of these products. Callie Higgins is a material research engineer at NIST who pioneered a technique to detect and fix those flaws. Callie, welcome to the program. Thank you so much for having me. So tell us, if you will, in a non-technical way, about the technique that you created to help scientists and engineers to detect and fix those microscopic flaws. Oh, awesome, yeah. So 
if those, for those of you who are familiar with 3D printing, it's a technique that uses, uh, you know, for ours, we use light to solidify liquids. Um, and it's done in a layer by layer fashion. So you have your desired structure and then you shine light in a 2D fashion. And then you iteratively build up a three dimensional structure by moving up a, a given platform uh, until you have your full part. And what's interesting about this, this fabrication process is that every single layer has an end this this gradient in material properties or great a gradient in mechanical properties and and at one one interface at, at one of these layers it's very very stiff and at the back end it's very very soft and like a rubber and so you can imagine that if you're trying to tie connect rubber to say glass, it, it won't really connect that well. Uh, and so th those those little interfaces can can cause a lot of issues with this, uh, with, you know, if you're trying to put it into say, you know, a, a knee or a hip replacement. So what impact has your work had on the medical fields? Yes, yeah, so we actually are currently working with 3D Systems and United Therapeutics to help them build out uh, an, an interface to uh, understand how to print an artificial lung. Uh, and so it's it's helping inform the development of new materials and new techniques uh, to actually fabricate and replicate living tissue that can then be put into humans. I mean, so when we talk about being able to print human tissue and <laughs> organs, I mean, how far away are we from that? How far yes. away are we from, you know, being able to print a lung? That's a really great question. If you had asked me maybe you know, five or 10 years ago when I was starting out, I would have probably been like, oh, we're about maybe, you know, a couple decades, you know, 30, 40 years. Uh, but with the pace that industry is really helping push this in, this, this whole field, I mean, I think that we're probably on the order of, of single decades now, so maybe 10-ish years. I mean, just working with United Therapeutics and 3D Systems, it's been unbelievable the pace at which they've been developing their technology so i i honestly i don't know because they're moving so fast <laughs> well i mean this is uh this would be really uh, a game changer to be able to print an organ i mean you the <laughs> you know not having to use a transplant and and things like that that would be right. that would be amazing and same with animal testing i think that's one of the main areas of use is potentially replacing a lot of the animal testing which isn't which is you know i think people have like moral reservations about but also they're not as they're not as effective as models, you know. They aren't humans, and so if we can help inform that, I think that would be a huge game changer for the for the biomedical field. Uh, specifically, you know, it's it it, it tar starts to get into this, you know, bionic kind of you know replacement of different organs. Uh, we're definitely still not there yet. I, I want to reiterate, we're not there yet, but that is definitely the biggest area that I think this this specific type of 3D printing will have uh, across the United States and potentially the world. So, Kelly, what about outside of the medical field? What kind of applications does your work have there? So, we actually are building out a lot of different connections with, you know, the automotive industry has started to recognize the need for, you know, kind of on-demand part fabrication because there's, you know, I think we're all very intimately familiar with the supply, supply chain issues. So, being able to, to fabricate things in-house and 3D printing really can afford that, that new kind of technology. And we, you know, this, this specific type of 3D printing, which is photopolymer um, additive manufacturing, it uses, it, it was really, really useful in the beginning of the pandemic specifically for, you know, printing out these, these nose swabs and face shield uh, kind of harnesses. Uh, and, and that was one of the, the areas that kind of like our moment to shine because all of a sudden no one could have access to this, but we could just print out a bunch of these. And that was, I think, very helpful for you know, the medical field and then kind of for, for, the, for the entire you know, US commerce to recognize that this is actually a very valuable manufacturing technology. So how do you work with private companies? You know, you mentioned a couple of them. Um, they're obviously benefiting from your research and your innovation. How does that work? Right, so what's wonderful actually about the National Institute of Standards and Technology is that we, our, our mission space is to help drive innovation in US commerce through our research and, and standardization. And so we have, you know, our mission is to engage with industry. And so we're really encouraged to, you know, engage all of our stakeholders just to make sure that the research that we're doing will have impact down the line. And so I, I personally really enjoy that because I've always been a, been a big proponent of, of making sure that everything that I do will actually help somebody or help help U.S. commerce down the line. And it's, I think it's very important because that's, it's the U.S. government that can do all that basic research and that innovation that will then feed innovation in, in the private uh, sector. 
Exactly. It's like why, why are U.S. tax dollars paying for a lot of this research if it's not going to help them down the line? And that's what I'm really excited about being able to to pursue research that will directly affect and help our society move forward. You founded the Front Range Industry and Postdoc Summit Association. Uh, what is that? Yeah. So. Uh, in the Front Range, it's it's an area of Colorado that has a huge density of, of postdocs and just lots of different government research institutions and academic institutions, lots of different companies. Um, so it's like a hotbed of, of very, very smart people. And postdocs are this interesting community of people that have finished their terminal degree, so they have their doctorate. But, but they're kind of inherently transient because they don't know where they want to go. They want to do, um, you know, they're doing research currently, but it's generally only a two year appointment. And there wasn't ever a concentrated effort to help transition them into, you know, these actual positions where they'll have high impact. And so it's been really nice to found this, this um, summit. So there's a, a conduit for industry and, and different academic institutions to directly interact with these postdocs that are you know, brilliant but not, might not necessarily get the daylight that you know graduate programs might, might give their students. All right, well, Callie, we'll leave it at that. Thank you so much for joining us and good luck with your research. Don't forget, if you miss an episode of Government Matters, it's at govmatters.tv. And find us on social media. Subscribe to us on YouTube, follow us on Facebook. We're on Twitter at GovMattersTV and connect with us on LinkedIn at Government Matters Media. Send us your comments about today's program. That's the latest from Washington. Join me weeknights at 8 and 10.30 on WJLA 24-7 News and Sunday mornings at 10.30 on 7 News to stay plugged in on issues that matter to the business of government. Thanks for watching. I'm Mimi Gerges.